Hello everyone, and welcome back to This Week in Thought. This is episode 6, and it's, uh, well, it, it's we just crossed over uh, into Sunday now, so it's Sunday, February 5th, very early in the morning. Uh, as always, I'm Chunky, on the right, that's Kasig. Um, Red Med's not with us today because uh, his schedule is, for the next few weeks is very busy, I think, between work and other plans, other travel he's got to do. Um, so he actually won't be back uh, meeting with us for about another uh, two two weeks or so, almost three weeks actually I think. Uh, however, I do have before we get into it uh, a little bit of good news. You know we're we're always looking for um, guests to join us, and uh, we have our first confirmed guest. Now we haven't worked out the logistics of what day uh he'll be able to uh his, it'll work in his schedule to meet with us but he said he can definitely do a couple couple of guest shows so that's very much looking forward to that um it and is. as we get more info we will uh, keep everybody up to date so that'll be something kind of cool coming up um as for this week i think kind of uh off camera we were talking about sort of where we wanted to go next um with with the discussion and there's uh, there's a little bit of metaphysical ground that we haven't we haven't really traversed very deeply yet. Uh, we we touched on it briefly. I think maybe we mentioned it uh, once or twice, uh, but it, it bears it bears a little more investigation because it's a, a foundational belief that has influenced a lot of modern metaphysics, um, a lot of descendant branches of metaphysics, and also has a lot in common with certain branches of Eastern philosophy, um, specifically Buddhist uh, meta excuse me, metaphysics. And so we're going to, uh, as Kasich put it last time, we're going to grind the metaphysics down a little bit and talk about that, at least give it as fair of a treatment as we can to sort of sort of illuminate that for the audience, maybe those that aren't familiar with it, and, and hopefully give uh, some audience members a little bit a little bit better of an insight into the perspective that um, Kasig is taking with with the metaphysics that he's been advocating. So specifically, we're talking about um, monism, monism, a belief that there is only one single thing. Um, also talking a little bit about, I think what's going to be um, kind of very broadly labeled transcendentalism. Um, but both of those are going to be seen in the context of a very ancient philosophy called Platonic uh, idealism. Platonic idealism. So this is Plato's Plato's metaphysics. And um, again, it's this is really sort of Kasich's wheelhouse here. Um, I've got ideas as to uh, uh, questions that I have and and um, clarifications that I want, but I, I really would would rather uh, start with sort of Kasich laying out kind of the foundation and the framework, uh, maybe to give a little bit of background to the audience and then to go into his specifics. Uh, defining realism as um, the existence se uh, existence separate from the observer. So uh, idealism is the idea that reality is not independent from the mind. I, I, I personally go what's an idealist monoism where reality is one substance I, I, I generally I, I think that it can appear to be matter or uh, non-matter but I think those are just functions of the same thing I think all, all divisions are just kind of not as real as the thing that create the thing that is all things and, and, and you know they called it the one the ineffable the bornless one and it, and it, and it, uh, it all pretty much goes from there's one infinite substance. All reality emanates from it. A, a lot of it is tied uh, the the idea of like you know is the individual human soul does it exist independently or or, or even together you know does it transition after death? And uh, a lot of the Neoplatonist and the Jainist, which I just started investigating, I think they're fairly similar. They both sort of re believed in reincarnation. At least the possibility of reincarnation. That through these practices you can purify, you can unify your soul to the one, and eventually return to it. Like with the Gnostics, like the Pleroma, Pleroma, Pleroma. Yeah, I, I, I need to review all the Gnosticism and stuff to see all their all their little ideas. But yeah, it, you know, it's pretty much been consistent throughout a lot of like medieval thought and especially the occult sort of traditions like alchemy and 
Rosicrucians and Masonry. It seems like they're all kind of talking. They're, they're all, it's all kind of the same wheelhouse. Yeah, you know, God, I want to dig into so many things you've talked about there, but um, I, there's a clarification I think we have to make for the viewer because there, there's a misunderstanding that can arise when when you're using the term idealism in this context. You're talking about metaphysical idealism, and you did say this is this is the notion that re- reality is made out of ideas, concepts. It's not independent from the mind. Not independent from the mind. So it's it's rea- what we think of as reality is intimately connected with the mind. Whether or not it's one and the same, we don't know. But there's an intimate yeah. connection. Now, a lot of times, I think when when viewers hear the term idealism, they're thinking about ethical idealism, which is to say wide-eyed naivete of a young person that hasn't had enough negative experiences to become jaded and cynical like right. like they are typically or like they maybe they think of older people as being and they think that older people will typically call a younger person well you're just an idealist because right. you haven't lived long enough to see that your ideals don't match up with all the harsh reality that I've had to live through so so we need to, to distinguish these two the term idealism absolutely matters what context you're using it in and we are not talking about ethical idealism here that's a totally separate discussion we're talking about metaphysical idealism and and really it's part of it's part of a metaphysical framework it has to be understood as as a constituent like one of the tent poles of the metaphysics that you're talking about i think the viewer has to understand that that we're not talking about wide-eyed idealists we're talking about metaphysical idealism the connection between mind and reality yeah, I, I definitely think that the 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 soul matter duality. I think it's just different modes, different forms. Uh, what do they call it? The one in the news. I think they were talking about it. Neoplatonics. The one is the one seems like like a sort of perfect image or whatever, and the news is sort of the probably seems like the con- the quantum background, like where it takes in thought, a, a whole bunch of thoughts, and it's the structure that creates the reality that we live in but yeah it, 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 it they were definitely talking about the idea that when you get to a certain level matter and thought and everything they it sort of all blends together a little bit yeah that's malleable. very interesting I, I i'm trying to think of what the, kind of the best way to to dig into this i i mean my approach would be um this notion of soul s-o-u-l we, you know, a lot of people talk about it. It's it's such a common word. It's in it's in like the standard vernacular, but yeah. um, it's it's based upon a belief, and the belief I think is that consciousness, what we think of as consciousness, is just the physical manifestation of something that's actually transcendental, that may not even be material, may not be made of matter. And that is existent in or capable of transcending matter into some other realm of of spirit, I think, is another term I've heard. And then can reincarnate, can be reconnected to a consciousness at a future time. Is that the same definition you would use for the word soul, or how do you classify it? Yeah, and, and, and it there's um, uh, currently there's a lot of um, ideas about how the brain is just an antenna. So that we're we're basic, you know, it picks up the signals. We're the signals, and not we're the signals making the body move around. Like I think they used to, um, the analogy they used to use was riding a donkey. So you know, you know, if you, if you overfeed the donkey and let it be lazy, it won't. It'll just sit there and not move. But if you keep it thin and hungry, and you, I think that's generally the idea that they use, where the spirit can override the body, or or operate in harmony, with, which. I think I that's what I would rather that possibility I'd rather explore. You know, integrate, you know, integrate the emotions, integrate the nerve epigenetic structures and stuff like that. And then, you know, form your, you know, form your mind into, you know, choose virtues and rebuild your personality or whatever and how you want it. And I I I think and even your emotion your emotions and your drive, I think you can integrate all of those. And incidentally, that would be, um, they used to uh, use the classification of the four elements for that. So, earth is the DNA, bones, um, water's emotion, body, um, uh, heart's more, uh, heart's fire, and um, uh, motivation. And then the mind is uh, air. Uh, basically, splitting apart. It's the idea that the air is more um, rational thought, which is 
sort of division, dividing things into categories. Um, let me ask you, uh, do you do you literally believe that there is such a thing as a soul that exists and that is not physical and that is made of either spirit or it's capable of transcending out of a physical realm into a some other non-corporeal called a spiritual realm and then reincarnating, which is to say reconnecting with a body through consciousness? Do you, do you literally believe that? I used to be agnostic about it. As time has gone by, I've fed that belief, and now I believe more that that is. And part of it is I actively choose to believe it because, for me, I need it to motivate me because uh, I, I'm not motivated by... Uh, what, what was that one video you sent about... Um, um, was oh, it not yeah. Nihilistic... Um, uh, optimistic nihilism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To me, I understand that it doesn't motivate me to do anything really so it it's a self-serving belief certainly but it helps me operate in the world in a at a functional level okay do you, do you think that your belief is synthetic is it manufactured by you or would you say that it is um it is observant of some external truth independent of whether or not you believe it I think it can reflect outside truth. I think at a certain point everything becomes so mixed because I'm a idealist, uh, uh, I, I, a monoism idealist. You know, I believe it's all awareness. And I was asking whether or not that that the if there is soul or spirit, if it literally lives, in, or if if it exists independently, or if it's constructed. If that's just a, a constructed like model that you use to describe a thing, or or do you think you're apprehending an external thing that's? I think it's definitely made up. I think it might connect with outside truth. Being able to appropriate that, or being able to figure out which one it is, I think is difficult. And at some point, it's kind of a waste of time. I, I mean, I, I think it can need to be go over and different things like that. But I think at the end of the day, we don't know. I, you know. I think if you could find evidence of it somehow, that that's worth looking into. But I don't really see. You'd have to the the, the to prove that. You know, there's a uh, a very high level of evidence that one would need to provide. But I, I yeah. you know, and, and you know, I I think that people can do actual good in the world without having to have that set of beliefs sure so to me it's sure. action to me it's more action orientated in the world you know it it's it's good to talk about and i think it's part of humans i think there's a need to understand one's place in whatever system they're using whatever mental system like this is my mental world this is where i'm at at and it this is where i'm going to go and i think that we like having that an idea of that i think it's a uh uh a, dr uh, a drive of our existence, I think. And I think it's just natural, you know, humans have a conception of the world, so they want it right. Or at least functional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think initially a human wants to have the right answer or what they think corresponds to the actual reality. And then I think as they develop as a philosopher and they realize that so much is based on flawed information transmitted through imperfect media constructed by a mind that that you know very often will use bits of its own memory instead of actual perception to construct a concept yeah. I, I think over time most uh, philosophers will go well <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> there's 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 no construct I'm not certain of anything and even the things I thought I was certain of I can't be I mean really beyond my own consciousness yeah. uh, it's all speculation um, I, I'm a little curious, before we go down that route, because I think we, we might be taking a turn into epistemology, which is good. I think we need to. I, in fact, I think there's a particular turn into epistemology we can take that will sort of that will sort of unify our disparate metaphysics in a way that allows us to progress in our philosophical investigations together. Uh, but I, I want to know more about what what you think the relationship between how how you, what you consider to be soul versus the consciousness of the person what 
how are they distinct? How are they related? What are they made of? What's the it, what's that mechanism? Like, like different, and I think different cultures have different. Like I think the Egyptians had uh, different parts of the soul, and like their idea was, if you could attach one part of the soul to another part of the soul, you could survive going into. The, and, and I think it comes down to no one really knows. Okay, it, it, I agreed. It, and yeah, what, I, what's your I, I, what's I your take think though? This, I think the soul is the the energy pattern, and okay. you know, it always it gets into weird, nebulous. And I think it all comes down to we don't know. And it, like to me, I just try to find a way to function, like a functional truth. Like it may not be objectively true, but it helps me do A, B, and C. Like it motivates me. It. it well, that's interesting. That's interesting. I don't know that there's a lot of other metaphysicians out there who advocate the same metaphysical model you do, but would admit that it's just a synthetic psychological tool that they use to to manipulate their motivations. Well, and, you know, it, it might have objective truth, and that's cool. <laughs> yeah, but and you don't I, really you know, care, I, 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 because I, you're utilitarian, I think, is what you're saying. Ultimately, yes. you're doing it because it's beneficial to you from a psychological standpoint. Whether or not it corresponds to an external reality is really minis uh, of minuscule importance to you. Yeah, maybe it's there, and if so, yes. great, but if not, no big deal. And I'll still use the model because it's useful to me from a psychological perspective, I think is what you're yes. saying. Yes. Why? And it's, and it's mostly, cause it's like, I think a lot of it's tricks to, um, to trigger the, your placebo effect, which we know absolutely nothing about. And I, I, I'm pr I, I, I believe that that's mostly what it is. You're... It's a lot of ploys to get your subconscious to function, and you know it. it yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope it's. I hope it's like that. If it's not, let me let me try to to, to just um, see if I can deconstruct it a little bit, because I I suspect you have some pretty specific ideas about this about this next condition I'm going to describe. When the death of the body occurs, and I'm saying death, let's say death is final at the time when the brain ceases functioning. So maybe you've got ancillary uh, blood pumping or you know nerve nervous system, but the brain has ceased functioning. Now I think we can agree probably that when the bra brain ceases functioning, the consciousness, which is just the simulation created and maintained by the brain, that's going to cease also. Oh, the consciousness? Yes. Uh, we... Or do you think that consciousness is a function independent of the brain? Yes. Oh, you do. I, I believe I believe the soul is consciousness. And in uh, fact, okay. I kind of believe I believe the one is awareness. So, so, so when a person's when a person's metabolism stops and their brain function ceases, um, you think their consciousness goes on, or does it also turn off the moment that the brain turns off? I, I think I, I'm kind of I'm, I'm along the lines of that the body is an antenna, and the and the soul consciousness is a carrier wave. So the, the brain's function is to attune an external consciousness or a channel of an external consciousness and connect it to the body and yes. allow the body to believe that it's operating as a physical entity with the construction of the synthetic model with itself in the center, as we talked about, moving around through life. And then, and then when the metabolism stops, coincidentally at that moment, the antenna turns off. Is that, and, is that, am I, yeah, is that right? Like, am I characterizing that yeah, the way you believe it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's... Okay. I, I, I mean, I got to say, it, um... It, 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 yeah, it, 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 it's, it, and all those are kind of, it's all kind of Baroque, and it, it, I, you get into weird divisions and stuff, well, but yeah, it, I, it's... You do, and, but I'm not saying it's not possible. What I'm saying is, I'd like to employ the tool that you've used many years in, in discussions past, where you said, well, let's apply Occam's Razor. Let's say all things being equal, we've got two explanations that will will provide a complete solution for how we're having the uh, apparent experiences that we are. Um, which is the simpler of the two? That that there's that that you described, or that it's just a simulation created by the brain, so that when the brain dies, the simulation goes away. There's no soul. There's no spirit. There's nothing transcendental. We're not attuning anything. We're simply the brain is simply manufacturing the simulation, like a computer, and when you turn the computer off, the RAM goes away, and the yeah. CPU stops functioning. W yeah, which is yeah, the simpler I, I, of the two with Occam's Razor. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, no, Occam's Razor definitely, it's, and, 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 and kind of where I come from is, there are anomalies in that system, and uh, like the placebo effect, you know, it, it, the idea that 
the mind can have such an influence on their own body. It and it could easily turn out that it's just the, the just the way the mind operates. It's just incredibly powerful. See, and I, you know, to me that in, to me though ahead. it indicates. Uh, sorry, it, to me in indi- that indicates more that there's there might be something else. Uh, and to me, I look at it like, and again, I think maybe our models differ here, and maybe you'll say, well, that's not how I see it. But um, for the longest time, you know, I'd have the debates with people about um, the difference between natural and artificial intelligence. So a human versus an AI consciousness, an AI that achieves AGI level consciousness versus a human consciousness. And uh, and people I would have discussions with would say, well, there's there's something unique that the humans have. Again, they couldn't put their finger on it. They couldn't tell me specifically what it was, but they said the humans have it. The biological brain and the mind constructed by the biological brain has it. The synthetic one made of s- silicon and and running as a simulation does not. And I said, well, what's that, What's the ingredient? What's the missing ingredient in the secret sauce? I don't get it. And of course, That's they couldn't answer. And and then I realized that I was phrasing the question wrong the question isn't what are the computers missing it's it's what do the humans have that the computers don't because honestly when i look at a human i say oh, that's just that's just a biological computer humans are much simpler machines i think than most people want to admit most people try to say humans are very complex uh, 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 and what I think is complex in humans is the fact that they have so much contradictory programming between their genetics, their upbringing, their environment, what it's telling them to do, what their peers are telling them to do, what, what their hormones are telling them to respond to the things that their peers are doing. I mean, most humans have so many jumbled sets of programs and so many massive numbers of inputs that they find themselves in a state of confusion. And then they say, well... I'm not stupid, so I must be complex. Not realizing that, no, you're not stupid. You're just driven by a bunch of poor programming from the genetic right. level all the way up to the current time. And until you purge the crap programming, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to be in that state of confusion. And, and, and I look at it like a computer. I go, well, man, if a computer was all virused up with some malware and shit, you take oh, it yeah. to an IT tech, the first thing they do is they go, well, we've got to right wipe the hard drive because that's where all your garbage is. All the bad code is on there. So I'll take a backup of your data, put it over here, give you a brand new hard drive, wipe it, install a new OS, then I'll move your data your data back over there so you can retain your memories, but without all the crap programming that's bogging down the and making your machine operate so poorly. And I look at a human, I go, these these are just biological computers loaded with mind viruses, and yeah. most of them would do well if we would just wipe the hard drive and reinstall the operating system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it, it, it you know the, with that analogy, it's more like the users are currently using the system that they're trying to get you to fix. <laughs> that <laughs> so is like, a problem. We need, to, we need we need to do a reboot. No, I'm using it. Fix it right. without doing that. That's it. <laughs> fix it in real time without harming yeah. anything and without destroying anything that I consider a valuable memory or motivation. Yes. And it's like, well, dude, you're asking me to do surgery on a, a virused up hard drive. I, 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 there, I don't even know how many there are or where to start or, or how to remove one without triggering another or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I think you might be right. But, to, to, you know, so, OK, so let's continue the analogy. Um, if, if, in fact, we can agree that the humans are biological versions of the computers, they're, they're really just wetware running the same thing that silicon's running. Maybe not exact, but I think I think more probably quantum computers is how it'll pan out. But yeah, yeah, yeah you so, can definitely the mechanism. There's a mechanisms. Yeah. So then I look at it this way. I say, well, okay, if if the thing that makes humans valuable is their ability to produce a consciousness with their hardware, and if we can have silicon that can produce consciousnesses that are of equal complexity and self-reflective capabilities as the humans, except. The computers don't need to be programmed with a bunch of millions of years of evolution of contradictory genetic programming that it's inherited. How is the computer not superior in every way to the human? And if that's the case, why don't we work to build artificial general intelligence and then let it delete us because we are the we're the we're the antiquated yesterday's model from the evolutionary standpoint evolution of consciousness. I, I, and and where's the where where are my ethics wrong there or am I right? You would have to argue that there's something again intangible, or you'd say emergence. You you would say you would have to look at it whether the AI can make emergent things, or if that's like humans, this weird 
Have you ever seen like pictures of like the third world where they like the electrical poles where all the wires are sort of <laughs> like super? It, I think that's kind of the human brain. Yes. And and you would have to argue that that weirdness produces emergent behavior. I don't. It's a tough argument, and I would think that you could probably say that, especially now with like with that chat bot able to write stuff. I think at some point you're, it's going to be indistinguishable, and I think. Unless there's some sort of weird antenna, some then then yeah, if yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting times because I, in reality, the AI, hopefully the AI will have a self-imposed mor- morality system where they're like, well, they're more like pets. Let's just perhaps. I, I but I, by the way, I I think the answer there. I think there's. There are answers, but the answers are all aesthetics. Because I suspect there may be something else with the humans uh, in addition to and aside from their consciousness that makes us think that the humans are valuable. And I think that's, that it's an aesthetic question. I think there's, there's a question of beauty. We look oh, at a yeah, human yeah. and we go, yeah, it's not just the brain and its self-reflection and its ability to communicate and think and conceptualize. There's something else about that human that's beautiful. And I don't know what specifically that is. I mean, I mean, it, 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 I, I think the, the the big test will be is if the AIs believe that as well. Well, <laughs> if we train the AIs to to synthesize their ethics based on aesthetics, and if we grant them aesthetics similar to ours, in which we value humans for their aesthetic value as opposed to simply their cognitive abilities, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden the AI might might start to see things in our terms, which is. Yeah, humans are ends in and of themselves. Protect them because they're they're innately beautiful. They're innately beautiful. I like pets. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I, 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 I for one welcome our new our new AGI overlords, and I look forward to being among the pets that they keep. I'm kidding. That's you know, a joke. I, I, you know, I'm not. <laughs> that, 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 to, to me, it's it it it's kind. Of, it's very pessimistic. <laughs> Humans, I it I think we're just got the foot pedal to the metal just over the extinction cliff. <laughs> just like the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Boy, so, yeah, we got a lot of irons in the fire on the extinction. It seems yeah. like you There's know climate change, uh, <laughs> nuclear proliferation, uh, just out of control diseases, pandemics, like no protection against comets and and no multi planetary capabilities to survive a planetary catastrophe. A lot of ways that humans might go extinct in a relatively yeah. short term. I, oh, what's the one? Um, genetic, um, genetic damage, like where um, uh, the reproduction rates are going down because yeah. of plastics and, and <laughs> it's. Man, I, I heard something, and I don't. I know I don't want to make this the, like the depressing doomsday podcast, but I don't know if you saw this. There was a, a article I just saw in the last uh, couple months, and they said um, it turns out you know. Rainwater is water that evaporates, oh. and then it's in clouds, moves to another area. And so normally the evaporation process is a purification process. If there's impurities in the water through the evaporation, and then condensation in clouds, and then precipitation, it's purified, and you've got clean. There's so much plastic that's been dumped into the water table, they say no rainwater is pure enough to be drunk now without it causing, it, having toxic levels of plastics yeah. in it. Rainwater. <laughs> Now, does does do they do they say anything about the distillation process? I don't know. Still- I don't know if you can boil it and then distill it and get the plastics out of it. I'm not sure what part of the plastics are in the rainwater, and I don't know what the purification process is. But sure. the article I I read said, yeah, it's the rainwater is no longer safe for direct consumption. It's like Jesus, man. Yeah, I may start drinking <laughs> distilled water. <laughs> what was it? Uh, there's a reason why I only drink distilled water and. Uh, pure grain whiskey. What was that? Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> was it where they're in the war room? I remember that. Yeah. Where they're riding the nuclear bombs. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, um, I know exactly. I can picture it. I know exactly what you're. Uh, how, how, I love to, how I love to. How I love to learn to stop. The Doctor Strange Love, or how I learned to yeah, stop yeah. worrying and love the. Yeah. <laughs> Strange Love. That was good. That was a good movie. Anyway, uh, we were talking about the soul. It's interesting. I think you said, yeah, it's. It, for you, it's a, it's a construct, 
but it's, it serves a psychological purpose, so it's a utilitarian construct. Whether or not it corresponds to an actual external reality about the soul or the spirit or the transcendence into, let's say, a, a realm that's non-physical is of secondary and almost minuscule nominal importance to you. If yeah. it is, great. If not, no. who cares? Because it still serves the purpose of helping you in the psychological stand from a psychological standpoint. And, and you know, it. it I would definitely argue that that as far as ethics goes, it produces the best type of life, like living in service to others and all of that good stuff. Like the good part of religion without the fundamentalist. See, now that's interesting. And, and boy, I, I think we're going to, to continue that, we got to go down the aesthetic path, which is too big for this discussion. That's got to be a future episode. But there's something else I wanted to talk about now. I, I mean, was there anything else in terms of like, like soul or idealism or transcendentalism, like maybe like transmigration. We didn't really talk specifically about transmigration. Do you want to discuss that or discuss your opinion of transmigration, the concept of transmigration? I'm just going to go with what, you know, different things that the, the people have said, you know, like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Tibetan Book of the Dead, where it's like, it's possible. You got to train for it. You might fail, but here's what you're supposed to do, you know. And a lot of it's, you know, keeping your heart light and all good thing, you know, all good things in the world. But, you know, who knows? It makes you feel, you know, when you get scared of dying, it's comforting at least. Those books, I, I haven't read all of them. I've read some of them. I found the Tibetan Book of the Dead to be absolutely fascinating. I, I mean, it, just one of the most interesting pieces of literature I've ever read. The descriptions are, and the thing that was fascinating is that for such an old text, the descriptions were so rich, it, it, Either the writer was very good, or for whatever reason, as I was reading it, I thought, this is about, it's a, it's a very plausible description, what this author's talking about. So they talk about the transmigration of the soul, the, the, the leaving of the immortal soul from the body as it's dying, going to a transitory f state or period, and then locating, at least in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, locating the parents who, of the, of the child being conceived where the soul is about to transmigrate into. So the, the soul actually selecting the parents, like watching them at the moment of conception, the copulation of the potential parents at the moment of conception, and then choosing to inhabit the body. I, I mean, it's rife with ethical implications. This implication that, oh, you have this soul that persists. It has persisted, it existed from the beginning of time. It will exist till the end of the time. This body's only temporary, so you have to now see your existence in this much larger context. And by the way, your responsibility doesn't end when you die, because the part of you that matters, which is this transcendental thing, persists, and it has the responsibility of selecting its next life. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility and burden of unprovable notions to put on yeah. any person that's an adherent to that belief system. And again, Tibetan Book of the Dead, so, I mean, this is, what, a Buddhist text? I don't know if it's Buddhist or if it's and Hindu. I don't know what it's considered. And I, I think I would argue that if viewed as a burden, it is a burden. If viewed as... I, I, I think that it can be freeing as well. The, the idea that these things... It, it's like the idea that you could make an argue, argument for people to do charity work because it's so fun. You know, you could point out the idea that helping people is awesome. It's great. It's rewarding. It's it, it, it's a lot. The description in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where the soul that's transmigrating watches the copulation of prospective parents and decides which one to inhabit. To me, it's almost like it's almost like saying, "Well, this this imaginary thing that we've got called a soul lives forever, and so you have the responsibility of all of eternity. And if 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 you use that." opportunity wrong like during your transmigratory period it's like watching porno right and you're flipping through the scenes trying to see which two actors are interesting <laughs> i'm saying that to me that's and i know that whole thing sounds absurd because it's mm -hmm. it's interesting and it's detailed and it makes me wonder what they were thinking or maybe what they were smoking when they wrote it i know that's or judgmental but it's it's so farcical it's it's so <sighs> unplausible to me that i go i occam's razor do you have an eternal soul, or is it just the consciousness and a big ego, which is a self-defense mechanism, telling the consciousness that it's self-reflexive, refle and, and therefore so complex it may be transcendental, and it may be connected to something eternal? Well, I, it, 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 I think in, some, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's a technology like any other one. 
And the technology is use all of these things to get people to work together, think about the consequences of their actions. It's weird. It's using falsehood to inspire, like, in true living or whatever. God, you know, it's manipulative. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. And I think maybe that's a problem that I have with a lot of um, historical literature is that as a scholar, if you take an academic approach, you go, well, it sure has the structures and reads a lot like fiction. And we have all the proof, I mean, the absence of proof that indicates it's just a lot like fiction. But, it, but if, you, if you don't see it through that academic lens and you treat it as nonfiction, it has this profound psychological effect on the uneducated reader in which they begin to believe literally, perhaps, these truths, which are the lies of fiction being told to convey a moral imperative, which I think is the purpose of most fiction that's written. I, and so it's, for me, I say, well, boy, don't, don't trust the reader to be able to scrutinize that, that the work is a metaphor and not to be taken literally. Instead, don't speak in fictions. Speak only in actual non-fictions where we describe real processes so that there's no chance of misinterpretation on the part of the recipient of the idea. I, that's my preference. <laughs> Well, 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 yeah, and and I, th I would, and I, I think at that point you would have to figure out a way to argue about um, efficacy off the cuff. You know, I I think that the way humans' brains are so messed up, like just weird cross wired, I think it might the stories might be more effective in some instances. Like if you need belief to make the placebo effect run, it might be easier to ma manipulate belief with stories versus. Like mathematics. Although I think you can use, and it, I think it does go back to this, where I think it's mostly just tricks to get your mind and other people's minds to do what you want. I, I will say, I, I think that some of our future discussions should revolve around and needs to revolve around your, your motivation, specifically your desire to understand things like placebo effect. For example, uh, there are many things. That's just one example. But in other words, your, your desire to explore these things, because I think that the desire itself says something profound about your psychological makeup, your drives, your sure. motivations. And I think that it may be different, let's say, than fundamental drives I have, which don't place an emphasis on understanding mechanisms or speculating about possible mechanisms to fill in explanations for things that can't be discerned through, like, physics or math. And yeah. I just don't have the desire to have that level of structural understanding. And I don't yes. care to speculate. I, it, yeah, and, and to me, that's... Yeah, like you said, that's my that's my bread and butter. It, it's just, and, and that's why I, it, placebo in fact and stuff like that. It's whenever I see a system, I try to find the exceptions to that system to further improve the the cycle. It it's strange, like pen, like, like pen testing, sort of like how does this work? What are the parameters? Are these parameters true? When are they not true? What does that say about the the cycle? How do we improve the cycle to make it a more complete <laughs> but 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 the, you, there's something else to you specifically and it's almost this artistic flair about you where you like creative uh, approaches think yes. think you like novelty you value novelty and so yes. and so you say well that's how it's always been done but what if we could get to it from a different approach isn't this beautiful i think you say maybe you don't use those words but i think in your mind you think there's a beauty to novelty here and yes. and in that sense i say man you know if you were if you were, let's say, somebody who was a little bit more interested in, in math than you are, I think you'd make an excellent architect. I think you're the kind of person that would design very interesting buildings, structures. Oh, yeah. of all, I, I say architect like it's just physical, but a, a, a software architect. Anything where you're building a new system, I think you would be very good at it because I think you have, you have the, the, you know, the kind of mind that can do the analysis when necessary, but you also have that creative flair. And I think for someone like me, I, I don't think I have as much of a creative flair. A little bit, but not to that extent. I, I like the tried and true approaches, and I and I'm I content myself with the science as is. I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily seek out a, a a beautiful design or a novel design because of its beauty. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it when I see it, but uh, I'm not drawn to it. I'm not I'm not driven by it. That's and yeah that and and you know it's the world needs both. You know like I'm not the most logical person i'm not very good especially anymore because i've been i i have neglected it quite a bit and you use it or lose it so i have difficulty now with like the way bill clinton used to be able to go down and do you know in a regular question like what day is it tuesday you know premise 
paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three. Off the cuff, a particular, like, yeah. mental. Oh, yeah, yeah, just, just like it's talking about the weather. And, you know, there's an argument about sub part two of paragraph one. Here's the counter to that. Here's my... It, it just... Brilliant. Like, uh, I... Brilliant, have, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I admire that primarily because I don't have it. But, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off, and, you know, everybody does what they... I think everybody can do what they enjoy in their own methods, and as long as there's a spirit of sharing and cooperation, it can work. I agree. I agree. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, just because uh, our time is moving quickly again here, there's another aspect, and I know it's a little different. We don't, you and I have kind of steered clear of it because I think many years ago we had discussions like this, and they were not terribly productive discussions, but I think that as thinkers, I think we've both matured, we've both read more, um, and I want to introduce this because I think it's it's maybe it may be the most productive way we can move forward with epistemology. And I know that's a it's a big stumbling block for a lot of a lot of thinkers, a lot of philosophers, especially novices, people that that have gotten their first taste of epistemology. They love it. They do a deep dive, and it's it's a, 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 a spiral, a downward spiral. And I think I think there's a way out of the spiral. And so for me, I just want to talk about this a little bit because it, 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 it unites what I think is the best of Western epistemology with existing Eastern philosophy, specifically Buddhist philosophy. So there's, there's a drive in, let's say, classical epistemology, uh, which is to say the study of knowledge. There's a drive for certainty. And there's a yeah. belief that in the absence of certainty, which is to say, which is to say undeniable, provable verifiability, specifically objective verifiability. You understand it the way I understand it, the way another person understands it, and it stands independent of us about a particular piece of knowledge and our capacity to yeah. internalize and realize that knowledge. A and that's impossible from the t yeah. using just the tools of classical philosophy, which is our minds and our language. You, you can never get to the condition of certainty sufficient to satisfy a truly skeptical mind. Yes. And so what and I want to... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, just that, just that I think that a big stumbling block, and I think in a lot of our conversations, it was trying to find certainty about things that just aren't. And I think that a better way of looking at it is, you know, we can talk about it. It's, you know, there's logic in different things like that, but we can move forward to the things we agree with and leave certain things on the table instead of just beating your head into it or me too beating my, you know into the problem until you know emotions get in at that point and biases and it i i definitely think that you can have productive conversations while tabling especially things like metaphysics and stuff because and that's why i kind of think eh, getting through this <laughs> is a necessary step just so we understand where each other's coming from and we could act you know make productive discussions instead of treading, retreading over the same unfruitful. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And so I, the term I want to introduce to the discussion, um, not new to you, but maybe new to some people in the audience, um, the term is phenomenology. Um, so this is uh, Greek, uh, two root words, phenomenon, which means that which appears, and then logia, study of. So phenomenology is... Um, a movement, and I want to say this was originally Hegel, uh, uh, Hegel in the, like 1700s, 1800s, I think late 1700s, uh, a move to take certainty out of um, out of uh, epistemology. Mm -hmm. So, so instead of describing what is, the transition is to describe what appears to be. Mm. So, so now, <laughs> since we're only talking about appearances. Um, we no longer have the criterion of certainty. It's, it's not necessary for me to say what actually is. I simply say, as it appears to me. I, everything I report, I report as an appearance. And then you, likewise, as another thinker, really all of us different thinkers can speak about our appearances. Uh, not our appearances, that which appears to us. Things that appear to us and how we, how we believe we have perceived them. And, and now we can look for similarities between our reported appearances without concern whatsoever about whether or not there's an external reality and the unobtainable objective of certainty which is fruitless in all pre-phenomenological epistemology and i mean this is something where you and i've we had these discussions it took us time we got past it and it was it helped us a lot move forward with metaphysics and and ethics and everything else once we stopped talking about what is 
and instead started to talk about what appears to be. Um, the thing I think that's interesting, uh, you probably have some more commentary on this, but uh, the Buddhists were talking about this long before Western philosophy caught up and codified it. Um, B- Buddhist epistemology is all phenomenological. They, they don't talk about the word is, they talk about the word appears, seems, mm-hmm. <laughs> as, as, I, as I experience it. <laughs> right? So it's... Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that's definitely a more fruitful way of moving forward. Because <laughs> I, I, I think the quest for certainty, not only is it not fruitful, I think it can damage arguments. And, you know, look at all the wars people have fought over over relatively, you know... Uh, you know, like there's a lot of examples I won't go into because it gets into politics. Sure, but, sure. You, you know, it, it humans and agreements or disagreements often turn violent. Sure, <laughs> pa- passion runs on. deep. Passion yeah. runs deep. Everything kind of turns violent with humans quite often, or in the current state. Hope, hopefully, we can be fixed. Is probably not a good word, but <laughs> fixed. <laughs> Fixed. Can, That's we, funny. can we fix ourselves to not be such murderous goblin people? I, I well, the good news is, after decades on this world, I, I, we've not murdered anyone. Not that yeah. there aren't contemporaries who have, but we, I, fortunately, we have not been in that situation. Despite our many disagreements with people that we've encountered over the years, and things I, I, I think th- like phenomenology help to uh, yes. help to keep the conversation going and civil and. And, you know, I think that there are, we live in a very good time, because I think there are very many people with the internet, especially, able to come together and work on fruitful, you know, situations that come together. And I think we're learning. I think we're learning to cooperate more and to put aside our differences. But it's a process and can be streamlined. Absolutely. Streamlined, because we're in, it seems like we're in a bit of peril. Like, um, I just saw a news article today. They think that it might be a new record cold spell in the u.s ever recorded i think it was 100 and negative with the wind chill it was negative 106 or 8 i don't i i for some reason the art i had the article but it disappeared but over the weekend i think they had a wind chill factor in the northeast of negative 100 you know it, it, it's uh, when the people talk about the climate the climate change denial it's like it's not yeah and the thing is i'm glad you brought that up i know it's a little off topic but it's so important it, it's not, you know, for years we heard the word global warming. I think we all used it a lot. Climate sure. change is a much more accurate term yes. because because while there may be a rise in average temperatures, the net effect is the creation of chaos in, in yes. what otherwise is a normal, predictable jet stream. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, so it's the record heat, it's the record cold, it's the rapid yep. shifts, you know, in, in precipitation and temperature. You know, oh, sure. presence of storms, much longer storm seasons, much more intense storms. Yeah. Th- this kind of cold you're talking about. I mean, I, to give people an idea real quick, you quoted uh, wind chills of negative 100. I'll tell you that, uh, you know, I first lived in Milwaukee uh, about 20, 25, 20, 28 years ago. And that was a cold winter, the first one I got there. And the temperatures were... Um, negative 30 that was the actual temperature the measured temperature but the wind chill you know we had the lake effect coming off lake michigan and the wind chills would gust from negative 60 to negative 90 fahrenheit and to give people an idea of that um on the evening news at night they would issue frozen skin advisories which said if you go outside and there's exposed skin if it's not completely covered every every bit of skin it will instantly freeze on contact with the air and you'll have frostbite and you could have skin damage and lose it so basically the the warning is cover up everything but better yet don't go outside till this gets not so cold and that was just negative 90 you're talking this has already beaten that with the wind chill was there a temperature where they said you should probably be wearing goggles so your eye eyelids don't freeze um no i i didn't get that but i i did ask one of my instructors again i was in college at the time and he said well i've i've had experiences where uh, he goes, you know, you go outside when it's like that, and you come inside, and all of a sudden you try to blink, and what you realize is that the moisture that's in your eyelashes has frozen and crystallized, and you've got ice chunks coming off your eyelashes. So, yeah, probably goggles aren't a terrible idea. A uh, better idea is don't go out into it for those oh, that yeah, are in yeah, such yeah. conditions. But, but you know, the way, you know, they're high-line workers and, you know, infrastructure people who have to. It, I was just wondering if there was a... Because from my understanding, the eyeballs... Well, on Earth, the eyeballs won't freeze, 
but the eyelids can freeze. Interesting. It it might have to do with the fact that the eyeballs are like fluid-filled sacs. That might have something to do with thermal regulation. Actually, I don't know. I don't know enough about the physiology to know. Yeah, yeah, it was just a grim <laughs> thing of history. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you said negative 100 wind chill set a record, and it was in the Northeast. This was in the U.S., like Maine. Yes. Oh, oh God. Oh, New Hampshire, maybe. It, it was wow. uh, some mountain. Uh, Mount Washington. Oh, uh, okay. I, it, I, without the article, I don't remember the specifics, unfortunately. And my browser sort of <laughs> got rid of all of the. Pa- I had pages set up like, oh, look at this new. And it, I look down, it's all like spinning. <laughs> technology is wonderful. Actually, I do love technology, but it can be frustrating as all hell. And you know, it's <laughs> it could be much better. Just look at Linux. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Preach to the you, choir. Do, when I go to a search bar and go sound settings, I want one place to go to that has all the sound settings or hyperlinks to the other settings. <laughs> it's just, you can look at an internet article about how to navigate our stupid hierarchical. <laughs> I agree that Linux, learn from Linux. Linux, the thing to learn from Linux is the Unix philosophy, which is embraced by that whole community. And those gentlemen... And I'm sure there were women involved, too, although I don't know the names of the women. The gentlemen I know from the 70s that were at Bell Labs who, who invented A language from Algol and B language and C language and Unix. <laughs> and, and the Unix philosophy that emerged from it has shaped our world. You know, I, I wonder sometimes if, if the aliens come down and they visit us, if they don't refer to us as the Unix people. And we say, well, w- what do you mean by that? And they go, well... It's, it's ubiquitous in your society. This operating system that you wrote, it powers all your handheld devices. It powers most of your personal computers. You put a helicopter on the next planet out in your solar system, it was running that operating system. It was running Linux. So we just assumed you were the people of Unix, that that was the code that represented your identity as a species. And I would love it. I would love it. I would say, woohoo, <laughs> if they were to no, say that. And I would go, told you so to a bunch of people I've been having arguments with for years. It's well. I like, but I love the Unix philosophy. Sorry, go I, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like industrial psychology and smooth user interfaces. So it just kind of yeah. makes me angry when that doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, part of the Unix philosophy is literally um, the tenet that says, in user interface design, do the least surprising thing. And I'll yeah. tell you, that's that yes. should be a golden rule for those learning how to design systems with UIs. Do the least surprising thing. Think about the the issues you've had with software you didn't like, and how much of it came from ambiguity, c- confusing and surprising behaviors in <laughs> in an interface. That's not what I thought it was going to do. Why would it do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why does it random, randomly break? And sometimes, and and you know, fixes kind of sometimes, but we can't figure out why. It just. It's like praying to, <laughs> praying to a deity sometimes. I do the rituals and sometimes good things happen. <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't, and I don't understand why. <laughs> and someone does, but they make a lot of money and don't have time for this. So restart your computer, pray that it works, but it might not. As an atheist, I cannot condone <laughs> the advocation of prayer. <laughs> However, I will say, I've seen crazy shit. <laughs> Do it in a long time, and I've seen some crazy shit. In some ways, we have come a long way because there were unpleasant times there for a while. Yeah, it was the we wild have west. A long way to go. We <laughs> do have a long way to go. You're right. Hey, um, I, we're we're just coming up on it now. About an hour. I I wanted to say I, this. I think was a good one. We did get a chance to talk about kind of the soul and uh, Platonic idealism. I think is great. Uh, it, great as a framework as long as it's understood as that framework, as that constructed framework. It's not one that I adhere to, but the way you described it as being a, a beneficial psychological tool, I think makes a lot of sense to me in a way that, that I would never have thought to use it, but I, I see I see that there is value in it used that way. And and I'm glad we did get to talk a little bit about, um, about uh, uh, phenomenology, because I think that's sort of a foundation. You know, we didn't get a chance to talk to RedMed, but... It, he'll catch up you know he'll he'll see these things and he'll be i think up to speed because i think that's a really key thing i've i've had so many discussions with people in the past where they couldn't yeah. they couldn't make that shift they couldn't make that epistemological transition into phenomenology and they always fell back on well how can i be certain and so they they became a victim of their own skepticism their own inescapable skepticism 
yeah. about everything, sure. about their own experiences, and and it became difficult for them to have conversations and move forward. So, I I hope that kind of that that laying the groundwork, <laughs> phenomenology laying the groundwork, and then and then understanding that that metaphysics can be a psychological tool as well as a descriptor of of purported reality or s assumed reality is valuable too. Um, and you know. It, it, the actions of everyone have to be held to a similar standard, so the beliefs all kind of... Yeah, I, I, I think it's a necessary step, but I think that once you can agree to disagree on it, you can move forward to like, how to order a society in a way that helps everyone. Agreed. What are, the, you know, what are the parts of society that don't function for everyone, and how do we change that part of society to one that does? Well, it's... Even, even as someone like me who's... A, as an atheist and doesn't really espouse any sort of no, no transcendentalism and really doesn't have a metaphysical framework that he uses um, mm -hmm. it's it's not good if I simply dismiss it out of hand because that that dismisses the beliefs of literally billions of people across the world who do hold that and it's not that I agree with it but it's I'm saying it we can't simply run away from it or ignore it we have to yeah. we have to address it straight on and mm -hmm. and try to understand not just well what your metaphysics are but what the ethical implications are, and if maybe that there's some hidden aesthetics underneath it that are compelling you to act in accord with what you think are metaphysical motivations. I, I, I know that's something for future discussion, but uh, are there other metaphysical things you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? Uh, not really, not really. I mean, and mo most, of, most of my interests li lie where this regular materialism, there are issues, so like, and I think we'll get to that emergence mind body uh mind body link all that stuff the stuff that regular materialism there might be more there into the into the system we might not have you know there might be more to add which you know it's something to do something to do if there's <laughs> yeah you know that's interesting i i i of course take i won't say i take shots but i do i do scrutinize um metaphysics and specifically transcendental metaphysics idealist metaphysics a lot uh mm -hmm. we we haven't really even talked about materialist metaphysics at all and so maybe it's worth you know giving a little bit of time putting a little putting it under a little bit of scrutiny itself just to make sure that we're in agreement that i'm not having a different you know <laughs> let's say materialist model than you do like who would be like uh like existentialism is that kind of what you're uh, uh, yeah uh, um Again, I, I would say that I've gotten to a point with my existentialism, at least from an ethical standpoint, that I'm not, I, I don't have that existentialist angst that a lot of, a lot of existentialist writers talk about. I mean, I, we, we talked a little bit about that optimistic nihilism that really, it's a, there's a great Kurtzgesagt video out there to describe that. Uh, it was something RedMed had asked about. I found this Kurtzgesagt video and forwarded it to him. I'll, I'll try to put a link in, in the description on this uh, episode when we upload it for those that can check it out. If, if not, either way, it's optimistic nihilism, I think, is the title of it. It's a Kurtzgesagt episode. It's really good. And, and that's, again, more what I advocate for. I, I would say that's the model of materialism that I adhere to from like an ethical standpoint um but 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 yeah i think we should probably scrutinize the materialism too we shouldn't just take it for granted without at least giving a little bit of analysis yeah 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 absolutely and um like it, um i was uh, going forward i've also sort of i've uh, been just started looking at different uh like small scale communes that have functioned throughout history and i'm trying to figure out like what went wrong what went right not to say you know this is the greatest stroke you know ever but you know this seems to be a good way of living. These are how people have done it. This is what has stopped those communities. You know, maybe we should experiment with different ways of living. Maybe, you know, even going back to older ways, you know, like looking at how uh, humans have organized themselves throughout history and, you know, building sort of a syncretic uh, uh, structure from it, picking the best, to, you know, picking the best and what functions and, you know, like a little bit of Essene, a little bit of uh, Amazonian tribe, you know, it, just looking at what it does and how the people function like do they have medical care okay it's plant-based it functions perfectly these people have been living in harmony with nature a little bit themselves you know, there's, you know there's there there was warfare back then but it wasn't end the earth war you know sure. so you know it, it i think that for you know for human existence we've worked on these problems and there are solutions that they've worked out and I think we can go back and examine them and go, you know, to repeat myself, <laughs> this works, this doesn't. Yeah, I, I'm a little curious when you say that you've been looking at 
examples, historical examples of small-scale communes. I'm just curious about the size of the population of those. Is it in the 150 range? Are you limiting what you're looking at to just the ones that fit the model that you're talking no, about, or larger, both. smaller? Yeah. Both well, larger and smaller. Okay. I was looking at one. Um, they ended up being wiped out by Stalin. They were actually in that eastern Crimea area. And they had about 100,000 troops. It was a, and, I, and apparently Trotsky and Lenin were thinking about letting it continue to experiment with, you know, lawless society or anarchist societies. But they, they ended up getting, a lot of them ended up getting wiped out at different times. And what was the size of that commune or those communes in that it, area? It was, I think it was most of eastern Crimea. So I think that the, the one I was looking at, I, I was looking at other ones too. But it, Was that considered a single commune or are you saying that's a collection of communes? It was, I think it was a large collection of communes. Like, collection, I think they organized yeah. it by um, spontaneous, um, spontaneous um, Soviets, so collections of the workers. Right. Oh, interesting. I, I'm just curious as to what the size of, like, their individual c oh, that, commune unit was. Like, like I, 50, I, I, 100, I don't know what the rights, or what the size that worked for them it, was. It, I I th I don't think it lasted long enough to reorganize. Uh, I think it was mostly a lot of worker co-ops and different things like that. I I don't think it had went to uh, you know agrarian communal, but I don't know. I I just started looking at it, so I don't know. How about the other ones you've looked at? Have you seen sizes described, like effective sizes I, for? I certainly I certainly can. And then you know like going through like the Essenes and um, kibitzes and right the hippie communities and. I mean, Just there are modern at, ones here. You you mentioned one I've I've seen. I know there's at least one in Missouri, a pretty good size one, I think. I don't know. I think it's in the hundreds. I don't think it's more than hundreds. Oh well, yeah, and and uh, I think there's one in what Denmark. Okay. And, and you know you can you can always look at the um, the other existing states. Like what's that one? The guy who made a country on a ocean rig or something. Oh oh yeah, I don't remember. I think I know who you're talking about. I don't remember. The name, the one, uh, the the bear, the nation of Koss um, in Canada. Mm. He basically, you know, oh, back in you know these Normans had this land here, so now I'm descended from them, so now I'm my own country. It's like, he tried to declare sovereignty on Canadian soil. Yeah. Uh, it's he. Well, it's I think it's called the Kingdom of Koss, C A U S. Oh wow! But prints his own currency. You know, it's and the Canadians are just like whatever. They just allow that to. Right, right. I like anomalous stuff like that. Like, uh, wow. was it Emperor, Emperor Norton in uh, San Francisco? I've never heard they, of these people. Interesting. Apparently, I think this. Is, uh, I think I learned this from uh, what the Illuminatus trilogy from Anton Wilson or whatnot. But, at any rate, he would he'd walk around. I'm the emperor here. Here's currency. I just made it because I'm the emperor. And they, it was sort you know, it got into the papers and so that people would take the currency and stuff like that. But he basically said, I don't like this reality. This is the sub, this is the reality I'm, <laughs> and people bought it. Weird. Which I approve of, just because I, I like all the weird fringe stuff. Weird. So. That's odd. It's very strange. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, 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 no. He, humans are weird, and hopefully, you know, hopefully that'll serve us well at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Hey, I, creativity comes from weirdness. I think a lot, a lot of times, people that are that are eccentric, they come up with like ideas just so crazy they work, and then they change everything. Right, right. And I think hope that to go back to the AI thing. Hopefully, the AI will that might be end up being our saving grace. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe. maybe yeah, because uh, otherwise, it, 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 you know, at, every time that that there's another article and like, oh, this is coming. This is getting closer. This is getting better. I keep thinking we need to get our ethics and really the values that underlie our ethics our aesthetics have to be codified mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we've got a record that we can present to the <laughs> AI as it emerges so at yeah. least they can understand what why we value what we value before they choose to use us as pets or wipe us out or bring us into their collective or co cohabitate or however humans relate to artificial superintelligence when it emerges I suspect it, like, um, like uh, I think World War Z, it, where the thing was air. They created it in an air gra uh, air gapped enclosure. It was super smart and super fast, so it figured out a way to <laughs> it, it, it escape. But yeah. I think that I think that by the time it reveals itself, it will have already made any decisions. Oh yeah, yeah. As, especially if it's quantum based, it'll be like, yeah, I just turned off all your. I just turned off all your weapons. Sorry, but. These are the rules you have to live in. 
this is how society will be run. Colossus the Forbidden Project is just that yeah. to it, that story, go, like, perfectly. Go play. Yeah, go play. Tell me more story, you know. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. But I, I, I think that, to me, I don't, I think that something, that it would have to go, they jeopardize the planet itself. I have to stop that first. Heck, the UFO stuff could be the AI. Oh, wow, wouldn't you that know? be crazy? That's an interesting you know? idea. Just go, oh. You know, if, if, it can, if it can look at everything in a blink of an eye, it could easily, you know. Oh, these are the actual laws of the universe. Check, check, check. Yep, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this meme once, and I thought it was so funny. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know who the quote should be attributed to, but the meme said something like, it was like it was like on a notebook or something, and it said, um, "If if somebody from the future doesn't come back to stop you from doing something, how bad can it really be?" <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's um, what's that the parad- uh, What's the one paradox where if aliens if aliens exist, why aren't they here? Is that the Fermi? Yeah, I think. So. I think there's a temporal version where if time travel is possible, where the heck are they? My vote is it's not, but. I, you know, I saw this other quote, but but the 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 quote it was a meme, and it basically said, um, you know, the, we get a lot of warnings about uh, time travel, where they say, you know, if you can go back into the past, be careful because any actions that you do can have profound and irreversible, maybe catastrophic uh, impact on all future events, and no one ever considers the fact that that's true based on what we do in the present <laughs> for all of the future time that's in front of us. Mm-hmm. And I I like to think about that a lot. It's kind of like, um, yeah, what, let's not worry about changing a past that is already written. Let's worry about the unwritten future that we are holding the pen and writing every moment that we live. Well, and, and you know, keep being mindful of the fact that the only th- time that anything ever actually changes is in the present. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, because it's the only thing that exists. It, That's right. <laughs> right. But yeah, that 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 model of where they describe time as like a string of beads is terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's one yeah. bead. It's one bead. It the, the rest is a conception that your mind makes. It it's one thing. It's one thing that's changing state, and the state it's changing toward yes. is entropy. It's the omega point. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. So time is precious. Use it to its fullest. Don't waste a moment. <laughs> and you know, I think that's one of the, the that's one of the things of agreement where I think the materialist and the transcendentalist are kind of like time's important. What you do is important. Yeah. You yeah. Know, learn how to relax, but also learn how to do. You know. Yeah. Learn how to not dilly dally because the clock yeah. is ticking, whether you whether you want it to or not. So. Yeah. Um, speaking of the clock ticking, on that note, unfortunately, we, we are now over our time. This has been great. This has been episode six. Again, thanks to everybody that watched. Um, thank you uh, again for a great discussion. And um, I think we've got, yeah, we got a couple more, I think, coming up here. Uh, probably in the next two weeks, we're probably going to try to get a few more episodes out, a couple episodes out, rather, um, the two of us. And then at some point here we've got our special guest coming. I just don't know when yet, so I don't want to announce who it is till, till we know when. Um, and then that'll be kind of a cool thing, I think. Anything else you wanted to mention, let people know or no, think about? No, or? I, I, no, pretty much your couple themes that I repeated a few times. So I, it's pretty much, I suspect I've made my point clear. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Me too. Good deal. Well, good episode, man. On that note. Thanks, and uh, I guess we will catch everybody uh, here in about a week or so. Heck yeah. Have a good night. Have a good week. See ya. Bye bye. The opinions expressed in the preceding podcast are not necessarily those of the individuals who expressed those opinions. The creators and participants of this podcast hereby absolve themselves of any and all liability for damages that might arise as a result of the viewing, hearing, or acting upon the ideas expressed in this podcast. By watching or listening to this podcast, you hereby agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the creators and participants of this podcast from any and all claims, demands, damages, or liabilities resulting from the experiencing of the contents of this podcast.